Why Casco Health is Christo Makat. Welcome to the IM4 Lab in collaboration with the Vancouver International Film Festival. We invite you to experience the Immersive Knowledge Transfer Series. The webinar features conversations among XR media creators, artists, and storytellers from our Indigenous community and culturally diverse communities. In this episode, we'll feature Nyla Anuksuk and Casey Coison, and they're going to be discussing the theme of relationship from land and all of the amazing work that um, they're going to share with you today. And I'm going to be facilitating the discussion. Um, next, we'd like to have some culture jam with Drumbeat Productions. And um, let's take it away for culture jam and the land acknowledgement, White Ishi. Hi. Mitzeb Quadrilum at Tanas Hank Minum Kanas Tamu Tana Well. I Gunnerskwalowens Gwens Equits Nala, Schem Tana Gunnesquich, Tanit Sin Homasquium, Tamahoi Huikden, Eat Selena August, Kathanisit Lash. In the language of my ancestors of the land of, of the beautiful river here that I'm sitting beside, I say welcome. Welcome to the land of the Hunkmenum speaking people. My name is Schemtnot, also Audrey Siegel. I am from Musqueam and I am the granddaughter of the late Stephen and Selena August. I want to raise my hands to you and thank you for the good work that you've been doing with the film festival and with your other projects. I want to thank you for making room for the people of the land and for our voices. It is through art and culture that we can often reach people in ways that we can't through rallies and protests and online petitions and the importance of us all gathering, the importance of us all sharing knowledge and being open-minded um, and open-hearted to learn and to recognize things that are important, not just to us, but for the betterment of all of us. I raise my hands and I say thank you. This is... Um, the owl song the owl brings medicine and knowledge especially in, t in times of darkness and especially when people are in the dark and I share this song that came to me about six um, maybe eight years ago to encourage that light to creep into all of the dark areas not just for each of you there watching but each of you e each of your loved ones thank you and enjoy. That outfit fits you perfect, it's your birthday. It's okay if you ain't working, it's just Thursday. I flipped the purchase and then skipped the survey. A little too early to say that your verses, yet I'm scribbled in wordplay. I was a kid in the third grade, innocent with my word bang. No account, but hopes I get out of the mouth to live up to my word per page. You tip in the bartender with the tip in the birdcage. With the dip in the first place, if you were not really winning in first place. The message is pure, the vibe is so high. Giving thanks for the medicine. We know who we are, we know what to do. Giving thanks for the blessings. The moment the confetti is falling down, I'ma celebrate with my mama now. I'm out here making my father proud. I'm giving back with no smiling mouths. Cause giving back is what this is all about. We made paper for the change makers while the haters were all in down, waiting for labels to call them now. Now when I see you waiting for tables to pay out, those tables are falling down. Can't hate on the hustle, don't front like you made it when lately you're not around. We giving more than we receive, God will then return the blessings, learning lessons, the verses, message and essence, pure and endless. The message is pure, the vibe is so high, giving thanks for the medicine. We know who we are, we know what to do, giving thanks for the blessings. For evil race. 
peace just wants to be your face between the pavement keep your faith and dreams of peaceful nations i see relations since violence won't solve the problems that feed the hatred suffered from historical trauma but i'ma keep it sacred and try to keep us placed in boxes locked in secret cages we're in this together today and the fact is that we are our neighbors not everyone is paid some of us made it off meager wages it's not the money that defines us i'm saying it we are all people in equal ranges the message is pure the vibe is so high giving thanks for the medicine we know who we are we know what to do Well, my hands up for our uh, traditional welcome and uh, land acknowledgement. It's really important that even though we are um, carrying out work virtually, that we always follow our protocols. And um, you know, I'd like to acknowledge you know the work that's being done at Emily Car, um, you know, in in the traditional territories of the people, um, and also. Um, I'd like to say that um, it's really great to have culture jam and, and to really mix mix things up. So uh, my hands up to Drumbeat for providing that for us. Uh, so my name is uh, Tracy Kimbono, East East Sumafat in Fields and Kington. Um, I am coming to you from the unceded, unsurrendered territory um, of the Okanagan Nation, which is located in the Okanagan. I have an extensive background you know, working in um, documentary, and I've also uh, delved into multimedia and, and other things that keep me creative and keep my, my love and my passion for storytelling that uh, I grew up with around my elders. Um, I'm here to facilitate the discussion between two incredibly talented and brilliant artists that are, that are um, embarking in new forms of storytelling and old forms of storytelling and really um, changing the landscape uh, for Indigenous artists, for the young ones that are coming up and for us, myself as a learner to uh, delve in to see what's going on. Um, so the discussions will happen with uh, Nyla Anukchuk. And Nyla is the founder of Mixtape. She's a writer for Marvel Comics. And Anuksuk was co-created by, Anuksuk co-created the character of Snow Guard, a teenage superhero from Nunavut. More recently, Nyla wrote and directed her first feature film titled Slash Back, an alien invasion horror about a group of teen girls from the Arctic. In 2019, Anuksuk was named one of the top five to watch by Playback, Playback Magazine. That's pretty impressive. Working in mixed media allows Nyla to channel her passions for technology and genre storytelling. Storytelling among mediums that include interactive graphic novels, film, television, and synthetic experiences. Originally from Igulik, Nyla currently lives in Toronto and sits on the board of directors of Ontario Creates and the Glenn Gould Foundation. In 2020, Anukshuk was asked by was asked by UN Women to represent Canada in discussing the future of emerging technologies in G7 countries. And if that's not enough, we also have Casey Croizen. Casey is a Klicho uh, Dene interdisciplinary artist from Yellowknife Northwest Territories. Casey implants, implements culture and technology in his creations that have the ability to trigger numerous bodily senses by combining a variation of installation, sculpture, interactivity, new media, and audio performance. Sounds like something that I would do at, uh, at our ceremonies and winter, winter dances. We have all of these kinds of different things that are going on and um, it's, it's quite impressive. Casey discovered sculpture and installation within his BFA and, required, and acquired an aesthetic of nature claiming architectural space by utilizing earth materials to create large scale visions that communicate element, elements of environmentalism, societal awareness and experimentation. His artwork now blends multi, multiple mediums in order to bring his ideas to fruition. His artwork has been shown nationally and internationally 
and has participated in many residencies, exhibits, festivals, and collaboration projects. In other parts of the world, such as Finland, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, the Netherlands, Poison also has a multimedia production diploma from Lethbridge College, a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Thompson Rivers University, and, and now in, is in his first year of MFA studies at the University of Manitoba, where he continues to build on his knowledge and skills while traveling to fulfill his art and music careers. He's also a producer, actor, writer, teacher, workshop facilitator, and advocate for future generations of artists and musicians worldwide. Um, before we start the discussion, we really want to thank our event sponsors, Ken, Clem, Ellen, and everyone at VIF Immerse, Emily Carr University, and also the Western Economic Diversification Fund and Creative BC. We'd also like to thank Jillian Sedell, President of Emily Carr, Stephen Lamb, our new Dean of Graduate Studies, Associate Vice President of Research, Leanne Rooney, Loretta, and the IM4 Matriarchs, and our IM4 team, Colin Van Loon, Alana, and our most recent interns, Rain, Sam, and Tama, as well as the Center for Digital Media Discovery Foundation, Microsoft, the Indigenous Screen Office, the Canadian Media Fund, and Story High. So um, maybe what I'd like to do is, is um, start off um, with you, Nyla, and, me, and Casey, and if you want to um, introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourselves before we get into the main part of the discussions. Sure. Thank you, Tracy. And that was such a beautiful land acknowledgement <clears throat> and music. That was, that was really amazing. Um, and um, you just, you told, you said so much about me. I don't know what I can possibly say else. Um, I, I make um, movies mostly and I like dirty things, I guess, um, comic books and, and interactive stuff. And um, I also know Casey just through a lot of these kind of, we've had actually been on a couple of these um, panels and discussions before which is actually the, kind of the only way we've ever really interacted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Casey Corza. Yeah, thank you so much, Tracy. That was, that was excellent. Um, really great introduction and, and segue into, into the discussion. Um, I'm Fleeto Jenne from uh, Yellowknife Memphis Territories, currently living in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I'm navigating my way for my MFA while in COVID. Um, but uh, I work on a variation of projects uh, spanning through audio video works, um, immersive um, VR artworks, and um, starting to make my own indie video game right now that I'm really excited about. And yeah, I work with a lot of different things because if I worked on one thing, I'd probably get bored. So here I am. And thank you, Masi Cho, to IM4 for setting this up. It's always great to work with you guys. Well, first of all, I, I just wanted to acknowledge your incredible work. I was able to view your portfolios and view you know, a lot of the work that you've um, sent. And I'm just extremely, extremely honored in it and really humbled by the, the amazing work that you're both carrying out. And um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about in terms of today's theme of um, our, uh, how we represent our land and our relationship to the land in our work as Indigenous people. And I was thinking about, you know, what are the ways that sort of I could understand this in terms of a new learner of VR and looking at your very advanced work, both, both, both of you, and within the Okanagan, um, we have a traditional model of governance that allows for all individuals um, to come to a place of consensus. And in a sense, um, more so in the Western world, that may be um, considered as holding space. Um, and so how, we, how do we hold space for certain concepts and ideas? Um, and so, um, I was thinking about um, the now can we process and how we understand our relationships with the land and 
for us in the Okanagan, the land essentially is our relatives. We're not separate from it. It's 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 all we're all connected with one another. And so the first question that I thought I would ask both of you in in discussion with one another is as Indigenous artists working with technology, how do you interpret your relationship to the land in the work that you do with VR, XR uh, installations and, and your work? And how does that inform your work? You wanna go first now or do you want me to go first? You can go, let's hear okay. um, <clears throat> So for me, it's, there's a lot of different stages and kind of like points of of inspiration to work from um when you work when i'm working with vr and xr um specifically um one of them is a recreation of of the landscape or recreation of the culture in how it exists and kind of goes for this push for maybe a bit of realism but um also implementing ways of like interactivity, maybe being able to see things that you normally wouldn't. Um, another way which I really like to pull from is how things could be, um, say through kind of being inspired by, by various things like how you see the landscape in the future um, or this like surreal sort of interpretation of the landscape. Um, which is something that kind of working on within a, within a project right now. Um, but there's also other ways to that, that you think about the land and that sort of thing that could be kind of like bad negative ways, right? Like if things get so bad within the north where it's kind of overrun by infrastructure and that sort of things, then we need to find ways around that or at least be able to tell that story um, more maybe from the voice of concern and to sort of push for like more progressive ways of um, treating the land and environment in general. Um, yeah, I think that, <clears throat> I think that a lot of those things that you guys both mentioned are, are really interesting, these ideas of creating space, but then also the idea that as um, when you're making whether it's VR stuff or AR stuff, you're, what you're trying to do is create a sense of presence. Like you're actually trying to transport the viewer to a different time or place. Um, and how you, you, how you do that is really kind of interesting and, and depends on the technology. And so if it's VR where you kind of are, when you put on the headset and you're completely blind to the rest of the world, you can kind of look around and be an entirely new world and see that kind of visually around you. Um, and, and then obviously sound is really, really important. I would say almost more important than, than visuals to kind of creating that sense of presence and, and 360 sound and, and all of those things. But what's cool about this technology is you can actually take like this sense of creating, um, creating a world or a sense of presence, but then kind of mess with it a, a little bit, or you can play around with that. <coughs> I'm sorry, um, I don't worry, I'm not sick. But um, the, so I think that what's kind of neat is that with, when you're, you can, you can add a bit of magic to that world using these technologies and explore kind of, an, a, kind of a different element of storytelling that you might otherwise. And, and unlike where you're watching traditional 2D content on a screen where you're having to, where the viewer is kind of watching things passively. In, in uh, interactive experience, the, the viewer is asking the question like, who am I? And so, and, and where am I? And, and, and how do I kind of um, interact with this story somehow? And um, so I think that with, um, with an augmented reality scenario where you kind of are, you know, you can put on a headset or maybe you're on your phone or just with a pair of headphones, you can kind of create a sense of presence in other ways, um, whether it's just um, uh, small kind of interactions, visual interactions, whether it's the auditory, um, 
360 sound design or even haptic feedback if you've got like sensors that might kind of create some like vibrations or anything like that. Um, and then it it does kind of, you know, when when we think about the Arctic and so so few people actually get the opportunity to travel to some of these places. Um, certainly the community that, I, that I'm from and also the community where we shot Slashback, it was, um, it was really difficult to get there. To, so to be able to kind of transform people to these places can maybe also, I mean, I think people kind of over-exaggerate the benefits of like creating empathy in VR or, or what we can kind of do with these, um, with these uh, experiences. But I think the more you kind of feel like you understand people, the more um, the, 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 you know, the better you, this, like, you know, we can all kind of communicate. I like um, mentioning that like sense of presence and putting someone inside of of your creations or that sort of thing. I think that's one of the things that that VR specifically <clears throat> excels at. And one of the things that pushes my work like quite a bit is you have this this story or this creation that you want to share. And instead of this like 2D planar kind of field where you're viewing things, you're actually able to put them right into the middle of something. And um, one like horror automatically became the most effective thing in VR because like it tra it has a really heightened sense of, of a lot of these triggers, right? Um, sound specifically, it's interesting how much like terror you could implement into someone just with sound. Um, but in the, in the kind of greater realm of storytelling, it seems so effective because you can get a lot of different sort of feelings. You can, you can get that level of scale and and actually feel that within um an area that you know you created either by yourself or with a team or something like that and it seems to kind of connect things so much more effectively than um you know maybe video or, or something like that um and with vr arguably still being like in its infancy that interaction you probably get like way more um you know developed within the future and and maybe more intense in some senses and implementing more like bodily senses within the VR experience. Um, and the aspect of like, when you mentioned like kind of taking the landscape and like messing with it, that's, I love that because it's, you're able to create anything within, within this realm. You're able, able to make people feel so many different things um, and within the creation of, of ours that like I'm working on with Travis, it's all about like putting this person in this dreamlike kind of state and having them like show it's in a state where we're just like showing them certain things, but it's like these these godlike animals um, that are that are kind of interacted upon within a dream. And um, it's a really powerful thing to be able to do that because a lot of you know stories from you know indigenous culture and your culture it, it kind of interweaves that like dream life and waking life at the same time. Um, and I, I'm just really excited to see where the technology kind of takes us and how we're able to feature our landscape uh, within the future. Yeah, and I think, I think the interesting thing about that is when you're kind of, when you're thinking about the story and say it was that same story that you're talking about, Casey, and, and how you would tell it in a 2D way and like a 2D movie, like, there's, there's ways that you kind of tell a story when you're, when you're telling a movie and there's like a certain structure you follow or, um, and then, but with, with a VR experience, I think that the audience has to kind of be discovering it, the story themselves and having to be doing the work to kind of uncover it. And, and so how you kind of make that interaction feel, I think the goal is to try and make that interaction as invisible as possible and feel as natural as possible so that that discovery doesn't feel like too much work because I think that then you're just really getting into a video game where then you, because then where, and that, and that can kind of lose people. But I think with, with when you're trying to tell this story and in this VR or AR space, the, the benefit that you have of things like haptic feedback, like 360 sound, 
um, <clears throat> and this sense of presence, you should be really leaning into the, the things, elements of the story that make those um, kind of those elements of the of the storytelling medium kind of really shine. And, and so it's like, you kind of want the audience to be, and a producer friend of mine kind of was explaining this to me when she was talking to me about a project we're working on together. It's like, do you want to be educating people through this experience or do you want people to be feeling things as they're going through? And then at the end, they maybe have like picked up a few things, but really they've kind of been going through this emotional journey. And I think that that's kind of, the thing about VR and AR and these kind of more in, um, these kind of interactive storytelling um, mediums is that you really should be kind of relying, re trying to give the viewer um, kind of an emotional experience. Nice, totally. It's it's really interesting how many different um, <clears throat> kind of approaches you can take to that as well, right? Like. Um, 360 video is a, is a very, you know, effective tool in, in regards to like um, transporting somewhere within a living place because they're actually able to like look around and, and experience some things as if they're just kind of standing there or sitting there. Um, and then all the other, you know, wide gamut of tools that are used for like AR and XR creation. Um, yeah. yeah. How, how are you implementing um, AR? Um, I guess specifically so i'm doing something that is um so it's it's kind of like a mixed reality experience so really it's just like ar except for um i guess the main kind of difference is that with X xr your digital kind of elements can have a fix uh, or your the real world can have an effect on your virtual elements um <clears throat> so if someone was to walk in front of it, for instance, it would disappear. Just like that sounds like really simple, but that would be like, that would take it from AR to kind of XR. But then in, in other ways, you can kind of um, even increase that. Um, and so this is, it's, it, we're gonna be doing um, headsets. So as you know, the most, like probably the most popular AR thing that you've ever tried is Pokemon Go, where you're just on your phone and you can kind of be walking around. But I've actually, like I, I was mentioning, I, I obviously have a bit of a bias towards sound when I was saying that I think that sound really is just as important, if not more, in creating this kind of sense of presence. I think um, uh, augmented experience with, um, with, with audio is, is actually really, really, um, can be really powerful and effective and, and space-based um, augmented reality. So. So just like um, an example might be, say you've got, Casey, you've got this band and it's maybe you and four of your friends and you've recorded this album, but you wanna do this cool thing where you would, you, your album release would actually be in this house and you have split up all the tracks. So now it's like the guitar player you've recorded and it's gonna be, he's gonna be in the bedroom. And then the drums are gonna be set up in the, in like, you know, the kitchen. And then as people walk through, it's like they're, the band is playing in the different spaces and you can actually hear, hear the drums. You can actually walk up and kind of imagine that they're right there. Um, and, and if you close the door to that room, you can hear the muffled drums on the other side. Like that's the, it really is this kind of cool experience. And, and it almost as if the drummer's really there, but, but you don't even really need the visuals to kind of, give that sense. So obviously I'm not doing like a band thing, um, but it's, it, but as you walk through kind of this gallery exhibit, there's going to be this kind of auditory, um, um, kind of auditory experience. And actually Tracy, it kind of relates back to what you were talking about in, in your question. Um, I forget the name uh, in your language, but of this kind of connection of every, uh, of the land to, to people and, and with, within Inuit there's this idea called sila that's this breath that connects all living things um and so with this augmented reality experience I'm trying to create like um how do I kind of visualize that that kind of connection that sila that breath that connects us all and then how do I attack what would it sound like and and so that's the kind of cool thing about about interactive stuff too is you can like ask questions like what would 
um, this kind of connective tissue, if it were to exist, what would it sound like? And then what would it sound like if you and I, if we were both connected by this thing, if we got close together, would the sound like get louder? If, if we brought, if there was like three people and we brought them in, would it create an even cooler sound? And like, how does the physical, how do, how do uh, like us as physical living things um, kind of affect um, other living things as we move around in physical spaces? Um, but then kind of on top of that, there's also kind of a narrative story that's, that's kind of being told about, about my family and, and their kind of connection to shamanism over the last 100 years. Um, so it's, it's kind of part um, gallery exhibit that you're kind of walking through, but also part like human video game, seeing how you, um, how you and the rest of your kind of physical world are, are interacting. And then as you go through the experience, there's going to be Kind of certain thing abstractions that essentially keep you from feeling that connection to others and then as you go through you have to do more work to kind of find those connections again i'm thinking this might be a really great time to showcase a couple of clips of both of your work um because um um in the work that i'm in the work that i'm learning in in and um, working on is the, um, the work of the huckleberry and, and protection of the huckleberry. And I, and I have worked with uh, Moni um, Gar, who has been my mentor. And we do have a little clip of, of that, um, you know, uh, working in tilt brush. And, and so in, in, in adding on to what you were talking about, Nyla, the idea of to make an all living things and how do we represent that because the other word for 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 the world are, is jimpula and essentially what that means is that to make this all living things but then you have that word jimpula which means spinning but it, but it's also a, 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 it, it's also more than just spinning it, it's it comes from our chaptik which is coming from a, a an older, a uh, really long, long story about um, how how we how we um, how we came to be, and so um, the clip of the Huckleberry VR, which we'll show very quickly, and then I'd like to ask each one of you to let me know what. Uh, let our technicians know which clips that you want to make reference to and maybe we'll get into some conversations about uh, indigenous futurism and that term has been sort of um it's it's become a term that you know um is um being used amongst uh, programmers and whatnot and and um, we do have a word um in our in our language that refers to a time before us in, in our language. And it really, the breakdown of the word is um, what's putting something forward and then that time, right? Um, but like you were, like, how do we, how do we translate that into a VR experience and what is indig indigenous futurism? So well, maybe, I'd love to see that clip. Yeah. That is sacred to us because it's been commodified, right? And so um, I would like to ask ask you, um, Casey, which clip you would like to show? Because I, I I've seen several clips, 
and maybe we'll start with a clip from you and then we'll go to a clip from Nyla and then we can continue the conversation because I, I would really love to see your work. And I know everybody else online would as well. Cool. All right. Um, well, yeah, uh, Clem, we can just start from the top, I guess, and I'll, I'll riff from there. Uh, so this is a still frame from a, uh, a prototype that myself and Travis Mercury are working on called Wanaze KOK Sea Visions. And it kind of takes the viewer through this kind of like dream world, dream landscape um, inspired by the North. Um, this is one of the first scenes that we kind of created where you're brought into this teepee where there's um, a fire that's kind of existing. Um, and then it transports you to the next sort of scene. Um, so the, the teepee within this and the fire was created in Tiltbrush and then Travis created the landscape um, as well as the Aurora Borealis and doing the, um, the camera work in there. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, this is basically the second scene within within Wanaza Keoke where um, we're, we're really playing with that sense of, of scale. Um, so for instance, right now, when you're looking at it as like a, a screenshot or a still frame, it has this, this you know, perceived scale that doesn't look very big, but when you're in the VR realm, it's huge. Um, and these particles are kind of flying on either side and you're able to kind of look around and, and um, view the landscape. A little bit more <clears throat> in that sort of realm to kind of like further emphasize the the dreamlike nature of it all. Um, so you can go to the next uh, image. So this is Raven Gods. This is one of the first um, pieces that I created within within Tilt Brush. Um, you see, I still have the Tilt Brush watermark logo on there. That was before I, I knew how to hack into the the um, config file and, and remove it. But um, ever since I started creating within within VR. Um, I've always been inspired by the like, Dene legends or legends in North Coast territories, the, the stories and um, stories in indigenous culture in, in general that seem to like weave through a lot of different nations and, and belief systems and stuff. And one thing that keeps on coming back and something that I've had an affinity for for a long time is not only birds, but the raven itself, because the raven is like the the arguable king of the north you know where it's it's there all the time like even in the summer um you know in the winter and fall when the the um seagulls leave the ravens stay there you know and so this kind of like loosely relates to the creation stories but also um to sort of serve as like a representation of um uh, like a, a council of, of ravens it's called raven god so it's like god-like ravens in the sky that are kind of like looking looking over and, and watching us and kind of like making sure that we do things right i i suppose um and you can go to the next um so this this was one of the representations that i was talking about in regards to like even if we see the future as something that's kind of bad Whereas um, this piece is, it's still a work in progress right now. Um, this is a sketch that's, that was done in, in Tilt Brush. Um, and I'll be, I'll be showing you how to use this program on Friday for the workshop. Um, but this is a, a herd of caribou and it's kind of like roaming the north. The, the piece itself is called Migration 2491. And it's set in the future in the year 2491. Um, also 1,000 years after the, the first point of, of contact um, when North America was free from genocide, um, where the, the North is, is so riddled with uh, diamond mines and so much infrastructure that it's, it's greatly disrupted the migration patterns of the caribou. So what this is, is kind of a look into the future and how we can save the caribou. Um, and one thing that they do is they, they migrate to their grazing grounds and, and where they, they feed and they mate and that sort of thing. And then they transport back to, to uh, their kind of like homeland. Um, so the only way in the future with so much infrastructure, infrastructure and whatnot disrupting their patterns is by way of like a giant portal. So the other end of this portal would emerge to their grazing grounds. Um, and then uh, when the season comes to an end, back through the portal uh, and back home. So 
it's uh, this was like the idea kind of concept sketch behind it, um, but it'll have kind of like a video animation um, narrative to it once it's complete. Um, and this is one of uh, my most recent works. It was a um, commission by uh, the Urban Society for Aboriginal Youth based out of Calgary, Alberta. Um, and this was leading up towards a, a live workshop that I was uh, that I was doing for one of their events called LunaQuest. Um, so this was inspired by the regalia and um, the dancers from um, southern Alberta, like the Siksika uh, Nation, and um, with other influence from um, other places and that sort of thing, but basically um, inspired by that area and their um, dancing regalia. So it's a um, an adult teaching a youth to dance, um, where there's the the ancestor in the in the sky, kind of like watching over them and, and dancing with them. Um, the piece itself is called "With the Ancestors," and the arbor um, is inspired by the Kamloopa Powwow uh, arbor in Kamloops, BC, which is where I did my uh, BFA, and it was the first kind of powwow that I attended as well. So. It, uh, it was a really kind of special moment for me. Um, and to be ordered to re-represent that within an artwork, um, I felt was really special. And the first time I showed it to someone, they kind of called called me on it. They're like, that looks like the Kamloopa Arbor. I was like, it is, like, wow, as if you, as if you just guessed that. Um, and yeah, the next clip is kind of, um, uh, it was my BFA installation from Thompson Rivers University, and it kind of relates to how I work with the land in some of my other um, artworks. Like I graduated <clears throat> from TRU with a um, with focus and major in sculpture and installation. And this piece is called the Mode of Ascension. Um, this is a, a big eight foot log uh, that's hollow from the top down about three quarters of the way. And there's a giant PA speaker in there. All of the innards from the, the log itself are housed underneath. And then a bunch of branches and foliage from all over the Kamloops area is present within the gallery itself. So it's creating kind of like an upside down nest within the, within the space. So the, the sense of smell is really impactful. And you can see along the, the outer perimeter, I have a bunch of sage that's kind of been uh, implemented in various different spaces um, to kind of like smudge a space without the act of like burning sage. Um, the campus itself is completely surrounded by, by huge bunches of sage. So it was uh, really, it felt special and it felt right to, to be studying there and that sort of thing. Um, and one of the initial sort of forms of inspiration in order to produce this artwork was the scene in the first Alien movie, Aliens movie, where uh, Ripley and the child are kind of like frantically going throughout the space and they go into the room that has the xenomorph queen. And so this, I wanted to recreate that scene from that movie in some sort of way. Um, and this is the way it came out, where it was like this, this giant log is is exploding all of this other sort of form of nature all over the room and it's it's taking over. It's like, this is my space now and, and now you're the visitor. So kind of flipping that script in regards to, um, you know, the space that we share or, or occupy or whatever. Um, and the soundtrack that um, I've chosen to mute out for, for this explanation because it can be quite a bit invasive at some times. It's an amalgamation of experimentation through found sounds. Um, through sounds of like a keyboard and a guitar um, run through some multi-effect pedals and to kind of communicate the harmony and the chaos of the universe. Um, there's some points within the, the soundtrack that are kind of euphoric and then there's other um, parts of the soundtrack that are quite abrasive and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm doing now within my MFA, because this, this, where this installation was held is at B, uh, Thompson Rivers University, it was the last time that I've had the facilities and the space to make a work like this. Um, it's about 50 feet wide, or 50 feet long by 25 feet wide and 15 feet high. Um, and now at the U of M, I'm hollowing out seven of these logs in order to create an installation that's kind of like um, the next step within artwork that I make like this, or I, I jokingly call it like a mode of ascensions, revenge, or version 2.0, um, that sort of thing. So, so 
little bit about. That, that, that's absolutely incredible. And uh, so now, did you have some work that uh, you could talk about and share with us? Um, I feel like not really, I, I, none of the 360 videos I say are, are able to play with um, on this player. Um, and I feel like that's kind of the vibe of our conversation. I've got, I've got a teaser for, um, for my 2D feature, but I don't know how relevant that is this, this conversation. I'm, I'm totally fine just moving on to indigenous futurisms and. Yeah, um, t take us away with, I mean, obviously you have a huge background in indigenous futurism working uh, with your resume, working um, with Marvel comics and whatnot. So um, let's begin the conversation between you and Casey. I'm, I'm really excited to hear. Sure. Well, I don't even know. I wouldn't say that I have a huge like background in in indigenous futurism. So I don't even feel like I really um, fully understand what <laughs> what it is yet. <clears throat> but I kind of, you know, I think that it's for me, it is kind of an, the freedom to be able to imagine futures um, and, and fantastical scenarios in which um, kind of indigenous people exist with our um, our traditions still intact um, and that or or you know there, there's also kind of thinking about alternative um, realities where uh, the colonial trauma never happened and what would happen you know if um, if indigenous people hadn't had to kind of lose and then relearn their cultural traditions um, there's so many kind of interesting ways to explore it and I think for me as someone who just likes like storytelling and and these kind of fantastical worlds, it does kind of um, my work kind of naturally fits into to some of these definitions of I guess indigenous futurisms. But I'm I'm curious, Casey, if you what your thoughts are about indigenous futurisms, or if it and you talk about aliens and and it's um, to me I think that you know it's partially a recognition that as indigenous artists that we are kind of growing up between two worlds like we've got you know our traditions that we may or may not have strong connections to we've got the kind of living in contemporary Canada that we're balancing and we've got we draw from like all of these different inspirations and and then so then our work is going to kind of reflect that kind of duality I guess absolutely um I mean like sci-fi technology, um, video games, they've always been there um, within my life. Um, and it's only kind of natural that that is something that is kind of like, I'm, I'm playing a lot more with now, um, maybe less video games, but like utilizing that sci-fi experience and that appreciation for it in order to tell our stories um, in, in a similar way, you know, like, even the act of like retelling stories right um you can still tell the story in a similar way that it has the same concept but it's never gonna radically change in a way that it's it's not known by someone else um and to be able to do that with like emerson technologies or or a way that kind of has more of a, a futuristic sort of sense about it um it's just like another interpretation of that and kind of like allowing yourself to explore that like creative freedom and asking yourself the question what if you know yeah. like um i find that the sense of wonder is something that that a lot of a lot of people lose over over the years like you go because when you're a little kid it's like everything is wonderful and like everything's fascinating and amazing and then you know you go through life you get older you experience things and it kind of tends to dull that a little bit um so I find that like exploring the realm of indigenous futurisms allows me to kind of sit and wonder and ask those questions again and allow myself, um, allow my imagination to kind of just like go as far as it can. And um, I found that that represent representation of that work has come up a lot within um, my, my digital mediums and that sort of thing. Um, but it's also kind of falling into my installation and like sculpture and performance work now, 
or I'm working on a piece called The Balance that implements the Dene drum with, um, you know, other Northern um, materials like caribou antler and, and moose hide and that sort of thing, uh, but utilizing contact mics with that. So it revolves around the act of singing. Um, but th like the way I'm thinking about it is making this prototype or this apparatus where the Dene drums are hooked up to contact mics and microphones and um, the, the throats of the singers are, are mic'd by contact mics. So it's kind of going through this amplification and this channel and the way that I kind of see it in my head is like round dances in the future will have all these neon lights and like the drum dancers will be on this like hovering kind of floating plane and you'll be able to hear their, their you know, voices and songs in like, um, you know, 5.1 is a thing right now, but maybe it'll be like 100.1 in the future i don't know maybe we'll have this whole other organic organic sound sort of element but um it's it's things like that they kind of allow yourself that freedom to to move into these other possibilities and like what would life be in the future 100 years in the future 200 years in the future like 10,000 years in the future and yeah and i think it i think it also represents a freedom from from having to do there's um cuz i think that there is, um, of course, very naturally, a, a need to kind of preserve our traditions, um, especially, you know, I'm from Nunavut, we, a, a lot of our traditions were nearly lost um, 50 years ago during Colin, when with, with the residential school system and really um, kind of the rebranding as uh, of shamanism in Inuit belief systems as, as devil worship. Um, and so it's, so there is of course a need to kind of preserve these, these things that were almost lost, like our drums and our, our tattoos and throat singing and things like that. But I think that there's also a need to kind of, um, you know, art is something that's kind of living and breathing and changing. Um, and so is culture. And I think that, you know, somebody like Tanya Tagak, who is ta taking throat singing and interpreting it into something that is totally new and performative, whereas it used to be just kind of something to entertain two people while, while they were like sitting around all day. And it's actually like a laughing game between usually two women and the first person to, to laugh loses. And now she's taken it and is doing something entirely different with that style of, of throat singing. And to me, that is kind of a, a perfect example of kind of this indigenous futurism and this, and this freedom to be able to kind of explore these ideas in, in new and exciting ways. And, and that's something that I don't think that, um, I think that it is something that um, some people have, and I, I, I know Tanya has come up against criticism for, for, from her own community about some of this stuff. Um, and, and certainly even just talking with a tribe called Red, who's doing music for my, um, for my movie, and I've worked with them on an interactive project that you know, this, this kind of idea of taking, um, taking traditional drums and tur turning it into electronic DJ music that, you know, like that there's, there might be potential kind of blowback to that kind of thing. But um, something that I think like with indigenous futurisms that it is kind of this, um, for me anyway, it's this freedom to be able to, to not worry about those criticisms, to be able to kind of interpret how I kind of see the world and how I interpret my inokness and my, you know, everything else and my storytelling into, into these projects. I, I really, I, I just wanted to add a comment in, in there is I, I, um, I, I engage, I developed a project called Picto Prophecy and what, I, what we were looking at, and this was back in 2010, and we, we created a QRL code and we worked with artists in our, within our Okanagan Nation. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out what, um, how the, the, we wanted to go to the site of our pictographs um, on the rocks, which is the rock paintings. And we wanted to figure out how that could inform our work, but also what that, what that was, um, interpreted for us and 
it was as you had in as you had so eloquently put there there was that for us at least there was that fear that okay we're we're we're, we're looking at something very sacred and traditional and how do we navigate that into a project which involves QR coding and and um, work, um, going online and, and um, interpreting that work. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to, like we wanted to know 2012 is coming and the, the prophecies, right? And we, we so we wanted to see if if we were, we could develop some work around that. But we certainly did come up amongst those challenges in terms of. Um, because we we are literally we were literally their future, right? So the so the silk people that were that were um, creating um, these messages amongst our nation in these specific areas, they were creating them for a reason, and it was based on vision and creative process and whatnot. And here we are, five thousand years later, and we come across it, right? And so we found that very intriguing. Yeah, yeah, it is. I've heard that before, like this, this idea that we're like our ancestors' wildest imaginations of the future. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I love the idea of um, being able to have the freedom to explore that to who, to who we are. And, and um, Casey, um, your work definitely represents, although you were, um, there was a there was a whole bunch of different things. Do you have anything any um, comments to add? We we're, were getting close to the questions, but I just wanted to know if you had any um, comments to add to this this discussion. Wow, um, like a lot of my advice kind of goes back, and it's directed to to the youth. Um, I find that from being from a place that is somewhat isolated um, and you know could refer to, to Nala as well is that um, to be able to bring this inspiration and the realization to a lot of our youth that there are so many more opportunities out there than that you might not be aware of right and I really commend people and organizations like um, Western Nordic Moving Pictures like they were the ones that got me into VR in the first place and they avidly like hit the road and visit those smaller communities um, <clears throat> to be able to make them aware that a lot of these kind of technologies are, are possible and, and they're able to work with and you can create things that, that would surprise you, you know? Um, you don't necessarily have to work in Diamond Mine or, or anywhere else like you can, and, and also that you can make a living as an artist. It takes a while, but like, you can get there. <laughs> so it's just kind of a message um, that I'd like to, to add to the discussion is just how important um, I find that it is for youth to kind of explore those opportunities. And like youth and technology, man, they gravitate towards each other, right? Like every youth that I've seen step into a, a world in VR, they're just like absolutely amazed. Um, and as other technology, you know, like video games as well. Um, so it's interesting when, you know, you're doing a workshop with youth or whatever, and you let them know, like, you know, you can make these, you can make what you're playing right now. You could probably do it better than how they're doing it and that sort of thing. And it, it gets them excited. So I think that's important to kind of, um, making sure that their brains are kind of like being stimulated all throughout, um, you know, they're growing up and even within their home communities. Well, we do have um, at, we, we do have an online audience, and I do have a question from the audience that is for both of you. Um, and the question is, what is your favorite part of storytelling through VR that is different than the 2D experience? And the question goes on further to say, how do you see your works passing down traditional values and knowledge onto the next generations? Um. Feel that like it's it's a way for us to to interpret our stories and our culture in in a different, new, more engaging way. Like the idea of um, immersiveness itself, like to be able to immerse your viewer within this this whole new world and environment and soundscape and landscape. Um, it's really it's really fascinating and exciting to be able to to do that and um, as we go forward 
a lot of those uh, capabilities are only going to be able to be expanded on through like development of technology and that sort of thing. Um, my new computer just came in and I'm so stoked to hook it up because it's got a 2080 graphics card in there and I'm like ready to kick some ass. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so yeah, it's it allows uh, allows exploration and experimentation and that I think is one of the the most you know gratifying sort of ways to to work in this sort of sense is um, you know your imagination is the limit and in a lot of times that could be limitless. Yeah, and I kind of feel the same way. It's like my favorite thing about interactive stuff is, um, well, well, two things. One, I think that when I make 2D stuff, it's not that I necessarily made it interactive versions of Slashback, but all, but I'm making in, my interactive stuff is all like is like using themes or locations that I was thinking about in Slashback. It just gives me another opportunity to be sitting in these same ideas. Um, and then secondly, it's just feels very different creatively. It's you're allowing yourself to just imagine, um, hopefully you're imagining, um, you're pushing yourself creatively and technically in ways that the, the stuff you're putting together has actually never been done before. Like the technology has never been used in that way before, or you're having to kind of like invent things like, can you, um, kind of can the head can you create like a sensor on these headsets that can pick up if you're breathing and 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 those kinds of things and like prototyping and testing th these things out and and knowing that like sometimes it's not going to work and sometimes it might be your the mistake might result in something cooler than the idea you had um and that nobody's an expert and and that it's like so one, people can't say like, you know, you don't know anything about VR because it's like, yeah, but neither do you. Like, honestly, nobody knows anything. <laughs> um, and so it's like, we're, we're all kind of exploring this stuff. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's really kind of, it is really fun. And it does, it to me has the same kind of feeling about making stuff that I had when I was 15 and, and had my mini DV camera on my computer and was just like figuring out how to make movies and, and stuff like that. So it's, it kind of, it has that same kind of um, creative energy to me. Absolutely. I, I was thinking about the first time I experienced um, video, VHS, and um, I thought it was absolutely magical that you could sit me in a chair, play the tape, t turn the tape off, have me jump out of the chair, and then I would disappear like magic. <laughs> And you play the tape back, and that's really rudimentary. Like it's really, um, but that that's where I was hooked. I was like, I think I was like ten years old, and I was like, oh my god, I want to do this, but I got to figure out different ways. So the next question is, um, how do you approach speculation of potential dangers of VR and AR? Potential dangers. Um, well, I. We don't, we don't, we don't know if it will damage children's eyes in like 20 years or something. I guess that's like a potential danger. I mean, I think you, uh, you usually err on the side of caution, those kinds of things, if that's what the question's about. Um, like I've had installations where you have to kind of sign a waiver and you have to be over 12 years old and things like that. If you're going to be a part of a public installation, um, but and then also it, because they can't see if they're in a VR headset, just making sure that they're either on a stool or something. Some people can get dizzy, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, definitely thinking about like safety winner. And, and also now that now that like with this installation that I'm doing with the Winnipeg Art Gallery, I've taken out the taken out the interactive glass walls because I've realized in no in 2022, no one's going to want to be touching walls that everybody else has been touching. So that's like a new hazard and, and budget putting budgets in for, for machines that can use UV light to like disinfect headsets. Those kinds of things that you just have to think about now. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the first thing you mentioned made me think of this meme that's like, um, when you're a kid, your parents are telling you like, don't sit too close to the TV while you're playing video games. And it's like, now it's like we're all wearing these VR headsets where it's like right up against our eyes. Um, and it makes me think of a couple kind of stories. Um, 
the the father of my of my grand uh, the father of my godson. Um, I've never been able to put a VR headset on him. I even tried like sneaking up on him and like putting on. It's like no, 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 that's how you, that's how they get you or like you know damage your eyes or something like that. So it's kind of funny. I've sort of like you know involuntarily like signed that waiver a long time ago. Where it's like, well, if they get my eyeball information, then <laughs> so be it. Um, I want to do this. So. Um, and another one was the first one of the first times that I even tried VR was was playing the game Super Hot, and I totally lost my 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 sense of where I was. You know, I was within my living room playing it, but I was like trying to dodge a bullet, and I like jumped out of the way and jumped into like a chair and fell over. <laughs> and so that's uh, I think that like they're doing a pretty good job in regards to like putting those those virtual guards up once you set your kind of like perimeter of of where you're at within your space but you kind of ignore that sometimes right like when you're when you're in the zone or being created uh, creating things um but i think that the those safety precautions will kind of naturally over the years will get more developed and as the technology develops then they'll be taking more things like that into consideration. Um, I personally, the things that I've kind of experienced was within creating in, let's say, um, a program like Tilt Brush, like trying to meet a deadline or working on something where I'm in there for like three hours at a time. Um, I think I was working on a, a project a while ago and I think I logged about 40 hours within VR within a week. And that's kind of like a standard work week, right? For, for you know anyone's job but like that's not really good to be in VR for that long um, and I felt it kind of like taking its toll on like my eyes and my brain a little bit where it's just like wow like I can't wait till this is done so I can just like get back to reality um, but uh, not to discourage it in a way but to be aware of things like that you know moderation and um, keeping your surroundings um, always in, in check and making sure you know where you are, giving yourself an adequate amount of space in order to create when, when you're in VR is um, definitely advised. Definitely, like a lot of those practical things that we don't think about that, that impact our, you know, how we, our, our perception of, of what we're experiencing. So, um, yeah, I, it just it was just a real good refresher for me and the reminders about being aware of your surroundings and um, you know the the effect on you mentally, right? You know, in terms of I mean, which the um, what you're experiencing. Um, we do have another question, and it's great that we're, all these questions are coming in. So the next question is um, when it comes to innovating on traditional media. What directions do you find to be important to explore in your communities? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, so when it comes to innovating on traditional media, what directions do you find to be important to explore in your communities? Um, I, so I've been, I do some workshops in, in Nunavut and in other, I've done some in other smaller communities kind of around in Northern Ontario as well. Um, and, but they're mostly with youth and they're, they're kind of VR, AR workshops. Um, and uh, I think that that one, that those kind that kind of work is really important, just this kind of capacity building work. Um, but, and I try and build capacity building and workshops and mentorships into all of my projects. Um, but yeah, working with young people, I think that it's it's just kind of um, I think that what's what's really important is just to kind of um, really make it clear that people's own stories and their own experiences are so valuable and their story is so valuable, especially especially right now um, and and trying to um, and that anything they do that is kind of that that feel is connect that they connect to other people are going to be able to connect to um i think that's kind of like my main piece of advice when i'm working with them 
And I also realize it's getting really dark here. I'm in Toronto. You guys, I think maybe are in Vancouver, but as you can see, it's getting dark in Toronto. You might have to turn on the light. It's getting darker. <laughs> Um, for my work, I find that um, it, it really does depend on the community and and the people that are taking part in the, the workshops or or you know, talks or whatever you're teaching. Um, one thing that seems to keep on coming up is is that those like local that local knowledge, those local local stories and. Um, as Nyla mentioned, like people's personal experiences, like everyone experiences the world differently and um, everyone has a different story to tell. Um, I find that like video is something that like video and 360 cameras and that sort of thing, it's like you put that into someone's hands and they just, they can go and just do whatever they want with it. And they'll maybe like, it gives them a chance to see the world in in a new way and it kind of like informs their direction and their creative process which they might not even realize yet right um and that like to be able to do that in in so many different ways and and to be able to represent yourself as an artist within either an indigenous community or not um is really an invaluable experience and uh we just need more of it. We need more, more new digital media and VR creators worldwide, especially within Canada and, and in the indigenous realm as well. Absolutely. So I, I have um, a, a, a final question for both of you. Um, so in our lives, we have superheroes that are our mentors in our communities and they could be our grandmothers and their, our grandfathers or somebody from our community that really inspired us. Or maybe they're not from our community. Maybe they're from our art world. Can you tell me who your superhero is um, and um, how, how they inspired you in terms of um, who you are today and, and the work that you're doing as an artist? Yeah, I think that I've got, I think I've got a lot of superheroes. I think that I, when you said that, I was like, oh yeah, I can think of so many. And when you said pick one, I was like, I can think of, I can think of 10. Um, I think like really the, for me, it's been really wonderful having a lot of other indigenous creators in the community making stuff and, and that we've got such a welcoming community that, that, um, that supports artists and supports mentorship. Um, and uh, for me through, like with the support from the Imaginative Institute and the Imaginative Film Festival and the, the kind of connections and offshoots of that, I've met so many amazing people. When I, when I first left film school, I started working with Laura Milliken, who is uh, an indigenous producer and owner of Fake Soul Productions, which is an indigenous owned production company. And so I was, you know, 19 20 years old and I started working with her and it was and I met Zoe Hopkins who actually Tracy you had mentioned earlier being someone who inspired you and she's someone that I met I actually started working as a I was an associate producer on a music video that she was directing and she was directing Christy Lane Sinclair's music video and I love Christy Lane as well so we all tra traveled to New Mexico to shoot this video and I was the like, as the associate producer coordinator person it's like you know I'm handling the logistics of things and and so it was really amazing to be watching Zoe who is this amazing indigenous director and um, just really clearly knowing what she wants and also just being so much fun on set and Zoe just finished directing her second feature film her first film Kayak to Clem 2 was so beautiful and I actually um, produced a, a VR documentary to coincide with Kayak to Clem 2 that um, where we went to Zoe's community of Bella Bella where where she and there was this oil spill that happened um, in her community and, and it happened two weeks after they wrapped production on her first film so we went out and we um, and we shot this documentary but to this day if I've just got you know if, if I've just got like a Kind of a horror story from work or anything i can just like message zoe and just get her advice and i think it's really great to have these 
contemporaries, other people that are kind of working in this in industry that you can kind of talk to and, and just kind of um, ask it, uh, like with no judgment, asking advice. That's awesome that, that you worked on that project. Um, the first time that I worked with IM4 when they brought me down to Vancouver for a guest speaker series, Zoe, Zoe was one of the speakers and uh, they showed clips from that. Yes. It was like a 360. Yeah. 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 And it was one of these things that CV, like the, the, the oil spill was happening and, and so we had to get there right away and, and luckily CBC was able to come on board as a supporter and, and get us out there um, even before the, the rig got out of the water. But um, yeah. Wow. Crazy and all, tragic event. Mm. That that was actually the piece that I was talking about that in, that was really inspirational from the speaker series. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for myself, I'd have to say my superheroes would be a combination of uh, George Blondin, who's like a, an author and writer. Um, he writes a lot about uh, about like uh, Tlicho stories and and um, and interpretations of the North, um, which I, I get a lot of inspiration from. Also, the the style of uh, Richard Van Camp, kind of how he's able to kind of um, wrap his head around certain concepts and and formulate it and form it a bit and then present it to the world just like, uh, you know, um, it, which always has this like kind of side of comedy, but also like really, um, really in depth and meaningful um, issues to the North. Um, so I'd say that those two people are probably um, two biggest superheroes in my book. I would agree about Richard Van Camp because he, when he was 19 years old, he came to Penticton to the Nalkin Center to the International School of Writing and I took the writing program with him. And he definitely is, you know, I mean, he has definitely shaped a lot of what we're doing now and, you know, after he left the school and the work that he's doing. So I want to thank you both for your your time and your participation and most of all the work that you're doing to inspire others and I'm so inspired. Um, I, I feel like every time that we do, when we connect um, and, and in these times we have to connect virtually because of, um, you know, just the, the way the world has changed. Um, I hope that we can continue to um, immerse, each, immerse each other in, 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 in our work and, and in our lives and in to have these intersections. And um, um, I'm really, um, I'm really feeling like I'm inspired and, I, and I've got like probably 10 more ideas <laughs> based on, on, on having these conversations. And I think that's why these conversations are so important because that there's a part of us that, that I mean, at least for me as an artist, I am, um, I, I know that I have to pay bills and I have to work and I, and, and, I, and I have to, and, and so that part of me says, you have to do this. And then there's another part of me that says you, but you're an artist, right? And I always gravitate towards that. So I look forward to these times when I can really nurture that, that spirit. So um, my hands up to you uh, both and the work that you're doing and, and um, um, continue inspiring our communities. And thank you very much. Um, what we're going to go to next is our DJ, um, uh, have some culture jam and our DJ drum beat. And check out I Am For Lab. Um, we have an, the immersive series coming up. Casey, do we have something coming up for our workshop this Friday? Yes, I'll be uh, showing people how to utilize, uh, how to use and work with uh, Tilt Brush. And is um, it's our art program. Perfect. So check online, check social media, check our IM4 website. There it is, working with Tilt Brush. And Nyla, is there anything that you want, would like to share with us um, before we close off? No, I don't think so. Um, this has been really lovely. And I, um, yeah, thank you so much for, for this lovely conversation. Okay, let's go into the virtual world and have some culture jam. 
The project will effectively triple our capacity to get Canadian energy resources to international markets. Fuck Justin Trudeau! Fuck Justin Trudeau! Fuck Justin Trudeau! Big chiefs in the building, homie, pipe down. Middle fingers up from my hometown. From underground chiefs to the braves to the briefs. Lucas got my back when it goes down. On the outside, I'm in a world peace. I'm the mouse in the palace inside. I'm a beast. Put a fist to the sky for the school tribe. Middle fingers up to the pipeline. Shout out to the red skin bloodhounds. Holding down for the red camp right now. My people getting mauled, getting put on by the dogs, and we're still being cuffed like outlaws. Resurrecting the indigenous, black snake killers. We got every other village out there fighting like gorillas. And we're here to take the power from the pleaders, legal maniacs. Your voice is a weapon and it's powerful. And I'm spitting ammunition. Ambo. Coming out the shadow, no camo. No Tar Heels here, no more landing steel. Don't fuck with me, I got hands. Bro, for the standing rock, I stand. They lose voice, I am. We deploy the brains, we destroy the land. About to take it all back with them village boys. Let's go. Still, we all gon' ride. Don't enjoy us. Don't enjoy we us. on that ride or die. Cause we warriors. Cause we warriors. And that's where to the wise. Fucking vultures. We stay loyal to the soil. Y'all can't beat us. Might as well join us. Oh, bitch, we go scolding. 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 I was a little K.I.D. Uh-huh. I've been feeling like my D.A.D. Every time he's around the R.C.M.P. Man, I'm ready to fight because it's me, not me. Man, I guess the apple didn't fall far from the tree. When the goom swell abused their authority. Tell me. I'm a snow goon, man. I bring the D like Richard Sherman in the L.O.B. Boom. When I talk about the who's who, you ain't got a blues clue. We don't fit the same shoes. Okay, old news. The is all we got and we refuse to lose. So we finna go. Jordan 2-2. Talk about boo-foo. Buy us. Fuck you. We stand and standing rock in the lay low. Middle fingers to the sky like the buzz of how to We can start a picket line and we'll be safe till we die. So true. Cypress Hill, homie, let's be real. Okay, here's the deal. Okay, here's the deal. My shit ain't never stank. Give me thank that a tank ain't never gonna spill. Get the message that I send, dog. It ain't really that hard to comprehend, dog. No, I'm screaming fuck you till my skin turn blue like Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still we all gon' ride. They don't enjoy us. Don't enjoy we us. on that ride or die. Cause we warriors. Cause we warriors. And that's where to the wise. Fucking vultures, we stay loyal to the soil. Y'all can't beat us, might as well join us. Oh, bitch, we gon' score it. 